And that's it. That's the end of the class. This is what you've learned. And hopefully you've transitioned from saying, this is madness, to saying, wonderful, wonderful. I love interrupt descriptor tables, global descriptor tables, local descriptor tables. Because this is Architecture 2001, yeah. So, you know, big picture, you know what you saw. You saw logical addresses, which were segment selectors and offsets. You saw global descriptor tables, the means by which logical addresses were converted to linear addresses. You saw linear addresses being used as virtual addresses when they were translated through page tables to find your way to physical addresses out there on RAM. And we saw virtual memory in six fruity flavors. We saw the simplest original version, which was 32-bit linear address space to 32-bit physical address space. And we saw how you could skip a level of paging in order to get a four megabyte page instead of a four kilobyte page. Then we saw the 64-bit paging, the four level pages. And again, we saw how you could skip levels in order to get two megabyte and one gigabyte pages. And if you watch the optional material, you also saw the up and coming five level paging to eventually allow Intel processors to support 57 bit linear address spaces. And while we didn't actually see it behind the scenes, these fruits existed. I just skipped the fact that you can skip the page levels in order to get the same sort of two megabyte and one gigabyte pages in 57 bit paging as well. So we picked up a whole bunch of friends along the way. We weren't going out looking for them. We just, you know, met them organically. CPU ID as a mechanism to find out what hardware features were actually supported. Read and write MSR in order to configure the enablement or disablement of those features. Push and pop FQ in order to read and write the R flags register. Moving to segment registers in order to change around what was actually being used as the code section or data section, although we saw with 64-bit segmentation, they're not really, doesn't really matter anymore for those, so it was really more the FS and GS that mattered. And beyond the move versions, there was the push and pop ways to read and write the segment registers. And then store and load the GDTR, store and load the LDTR, store and load the task register, store and load the IDTR, these many tables that made up the various information that we covered in this class, as well as the set and clear interrupt flag, which changed and masked interrupts as necessary. We saw a bunch of different software interrupt mechanisms, software assembly instructions to invoke hardware interrupt vectors from the interrupt descriptor table. We saw the system call functions, sorry, system call assembly instructions, which were used both on 32 and 64 bit systems. And we saw the, the back and forth between what Intel supported and what AMD supported and how some are supported. Some are preferred on 64 bit versus 32 bit because of their hardware support and the different platforms. And then those peripherally applicable things like swap GS and read and write FS and GS base because basically the whole 64-bit segmentation system was designed specifically to allow people to keep using what they were using anyways, which was FS and GS as information such as, you know, thread local information or kernel data structures. RDTSC, that was an assembly instruction I just threw in for the heck of it because, you know, you needed a break at that point in the class. You needed to rest your brain. So that's just a fun way to find out how many ticks have elapsed at a given point in time. Reading and writing the control registers, which all were useful in the context of paging, that's where we saw it, but they've got all sorts of other little bits. You know, you should go read and check out what the other bits do. And only, although there were like a giant ton of tables for paging, there was only one assembly instruction that, you know, specifically was related to that, that we picked up, and that was invalidate page which was the way to kick things out of the page table if they were marked as global, because everything gets kicked out when you change CR3, except the global pages. They need to be kicked out specifically. And a little bit of debug register fun and a little bit of port IO fun. So that was the class, you know, some closing thoughts about it. This class, you know, I used Windows as a means to an end to exemplify the particular hardware mechanisms was not, you know, this was not meant to be a Windows internals class that'll come out later, that'll build on this type of class. But so now that you understand like the actual mechanisms as described in the Intel manuals, you can go out and read the manuals. They're fun, read the fun manuals. 
in order to learn more about how these mechanisms work. And you can also learn how they work in your favorite operating system. Go grab an internals book and see how that OS uses it. If it happens to have some open source like XNU for Mac OS or Linux kernel, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, you can go find out how those different operating systems use all of these mechanisms. Also, you're much better suited now to try to learn things like virtualization because OS is to process as hypervisor is to OS. Because basically an operating system manipulates the hardware resources on behalf of you know, the memory management for different processes, things like that. They're context switching, they're swapping things around, they're time division multiplexing amongst various processes. And virtualization has to be able to do the same thing amongst the multiple operating systems. So if you start thinking to yourself, you know, the operating system is, or sorry, the virtualization system is playing games with an operating system, it starts to raise interesting questions about how can you actually lie to an operating system about, you know, the contents of the global descriptor table register, control register three, four, zero, one, whatever. So the different, you know, so this this should like give you a sense of like how hard it is to like bolt on virtualization support to a architecture like Intel, which didn't have it to begin with. It also should give you a sense of why there's these leaky mechanisms by which if, you know, malicious software really wants to detect that it's in a virtual machine, it probably can. Um, and it also should start to give you a sense of how malicious software might use virtualization to its advantage. We covered red pill in this class, which was you know, a mechanism that was used in order to detect virtualization. Later on, that was followed with a talk called blue pill, which was using the virtualization in order to blue pill or, you know, take and put the operating system in the matrix, keep it in the matrix, use the virtualization system in order to take control and then lie to the operating system about the state of the world and whether it was infected or not. So this, this sort of class is the, the baseline information that you need to know to start digging into virtualization, which will be you know, future classes. Also, this is just you know, pontification. You, know, you can skip and be done at this point. This, all these closing thoughts are just pontification. But uh, you know, in my opinion, it's very frequently the case that there are tool users and there are tool understanders. And of course, there are tool builders who must necessarily be tool understanders. And, you know, I think that everyone always starts as a tool user. Of course, if you start doing reverse engineering, you just have to take a debugger, be shown how it works, be shown how to read assembly, things like that. And that's the appropriate starting point. But as you want to mature in your capabilities, you need to move into being a tool understander. You have to say, how does the debugger actually work? What is it doing behind the scenes? And so if you look at the people who are really, you know, always pushing research forward and pushing, you know, the industry forward, it's people who are understanders and builders. So you should always try to move your way towards being an understander. As an aside, if you ever have to find yourself interviewing someone and you're trying to get a sense of, you know, interviewing someone for perhaps a security architect type position, a low level security type person, and you need to find out, you know, is this really a tool builder? Is it a tool understander? Is it just a tool user? Something like how does a debugger work is a great question that can you know, elicit uh, details of how deeply they understand the system. You can say, how does debugger work? And they say, oh, well, you know, it uses a software interrupt. Okay, which software interrupt? And, you know, okay, well, what's the specific, you know, byte that's used for the software interrupt? How does the debugger, you know, rewrite to the assembly instruction on the fly? That kind of thing. So it's a good question to like drill down on how deep people know things. And of course you at this point know things much better than most people do. And, you know, just thinking about things from an adversar adversarial perspective, uh, you know, people who build software like, you know, hypervisor rootkits, uh, kernel mode rootkits, firmware attacks, these are people who come from a perspective of really understanding the system at a very deep level. And so if you are a defender, if your job is to defend as opposed to attack, then you have to think like, you know, what would it mean if you're trying to defend a system and the attacker has spent, you know, days, weeks, months, years reading Intel manuals, understanding the system at an extremely deep level, you know, are you hopelessly outclassed and outmatched at that point? Possibly, you know, the point is it's really hard to defend against an attacker who understands the system much better than you do. So that's again why you need to be a tool understander. That's why you have to love reading the fun manuals and why you have to, you know, always want to go deep, which is 
why open security training is trying to help you go deeper faster all right well that's it for this class goodbye i'll hopefully see you again in another class coming up soon